and by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. are tuned to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very dynamic campus of Montana State University, and coming to you over the Montana Public Television System. I'm Jack Rieselman, retired professor of plant pathology, and I'm happy to be your host this evening. We're going to have an interesting program tonight. As we started off the spring series featuring women in agriculture, we're going to continue that tonight, and we're going to look at a lot of different things in the College of Agriculture tonight, but especially precision farming. That's a new technology to me. It's been around for a while, but we're gonna learn a lot more about it this evening. So before we get started this evening, let me introduce the panel. Way to my left, the end of the table is Yuta McKelvey. She's a plant pathologist here at Montana State University. Disease questions tonight, lawn, garden, home, wheat, <laughs> Pulse, anything you want to know, she can answer it this evening. Our special guest this evening, I'm happy to have her here, Shrika Labajwa. She's the Dean of the College of Agriculture here, and she's going to talk about what the College of Ag is doing, a little bit about precision ag. We stole her a couple years ago from North Dakota State University. <laughs> they did get back at us in the football field this past right. year, so I think her revenge is there. As usual, uh, Lori. Lori Krasinik, glad to have you here. She's an insect diagnostician, and she does know a lot about insects. And she did bring another pet along this <laughs> evening. We'll get to that in a little bit. Tim, Tim Seipel, he's been here several times. I think he's a weed specialist, but I think he's kind of a cropland weed specialist too. And answering the phones this evening, both remotely, Mike Giroux. Mike is the head of the plant science uh, and plant pathology department and Judge Bruce Lobel, and Judge Lobel is just one of the guys we used to have on here all the time. He's an interesting individual, and he's really become a very good person to answer the phone for us. Before we go any farther, Shrikala, tell us how the College Bag is doing right now. Uh, Jack, we are doing very well. You know, it's almost uh, the end of the semester. One more month left for the semester to end. I, I just can't believe it, you know, where we were a year back or two years back. Um, but uh, b beyond that, you know, our uh, uh, enrollment has been going up steadily. Our research expenditures have been going up. So college is doing very well. And uh, good relationship with the people outside of the university with our producers. So, yeah, I, very happy. <laughs> I've been very impressed with the last few years the way the college has advanced, especially since you've come here. And you might just want to mention one of our new programs briefly, and we do have some questions from last week about it. Tell us a little bit about the Precision Ag program here at Montana State University. Um, you know, Jack, when I interviewed three, four years, or three and a half years back, uh, my search committee had somebody from uh, our Montana Grain Growers Association, Lola Raska, you probably know her, she's very famous in this state. <laughs> so she, at the time, she asked me this question, you know, are you going to start a, a precision egg program here? And later on when I joined, um, again she said, you know, we want to see a precision egg program in Montana. So I have been working on it, and not just me, it is, you know, our college has been working on it. And uh, um, finally, with the, with the support from Northwest Farm Credit 
credit services. We are able to hire, we hired four new faculty members and we also have a few faculty members who are our veteran faculty who are working in that field. So I'm very happy to say we brought some new uh, skills to Montana and they are working. They have been here for a couple or less than two months or two, yeah, two months now. Um, they are working to, to uh, identify where our strengths are, where our needs are, who our partners are, and, uh, and uh, you know, come up with a, with a plan to move forward. So Precision Agriculture is our new, uh, new program and I'm very excited. It is an integrated program. It's not just research. It is we have to do research and development. We also have to educate our students. You know, the students coming out of our program, they need to have they need to have the opportunity to have skills in precision ag. They go to work for various companies or become a, a agronomist. They need to know, you know, what data they are collecting, what they need to collect, how to analyze it. So teaching is a component of that, and also outreach. You know, the research we do do in the labs, we need to be um, telling our story, educating our producers about the research so they can adopt, they can take advantage of it. So it is research teaching and, uh, and outreach. Okay, and on that note, the caller, our question came in via Slack. The questions come in on this little con contraption I have here. It's called a computer, I think, and the technology is called Slack. But from Bozeman, what can MSU College of Agriculture do to get Montana students to more seriously consider careers in agriculture? And that's a good question because the jobs are there right now. And yeah. agriculture is a very dynamic, changing science right now. So yeah. have at it. Yeah, you know, Jack, this is something we are continually working to, to become better at. Um, you know, we have, um, re our research centers in, in, you know, there are seven research centers across the state. We also have our extension offices in every county. So we are looking at some new, new ways to recruit students to let them know agriculture is, you know, there, there is a, uh, perhaps a, some misconception in, in some parts that agriculture is all about, just about farming, you know, growing your crop or, or your livestock. Actually, it is, it is pretty broad, you know, there, there are a variety of careers. So every opportunity we get, we are looking at how we can educate people you know it's not just educating the students it's also educating the parents and the grandparents so we we are trying to tell our stories you know um, I actually uh, sat down with our, uh, our communication person this last week and they talked about a communication plan talking about you know alternating between our uh, stories of research how our research is impacting Montana agriculture and also telling the stories of our students our students go into, you know, they become agronomists, they become animal science, people scientists, microbiologists, teachers, bankers, um, business uh, person, you know, they can, and, and uh, doctors and veterinarians and uh, um, you name it, there are, you know, environmental scientists and there are, there are a variety of areas they can go into and become successful and become contributing members of the community. So, you know, we, this is, uh, this is, we are, you know, we are seeing a, um, you know, looking at the rural areas, there are several drawbacks, you know, one is, uh, if you don't have a, a family member or someone you know who has gone to college, who can, whom you can talk about what you can do in college, you know that is a disadvantage. So, um, can we use our research centers and uh, our extension offices to spread that information? The, the very many meetings we go to, agricultural organizations, field days, can we spread that information that these are the opportunities in in um, in the college and also so our faculty getting out there and working with the schools, you know, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, having programs, you know, bringing those students to, to um, Bozeman, sometimes going to their classrooms and uh, telling them about the disciplines we have and the jobs they can go into. So we try. Okay, you know, good answer. And I will tell you, I grew up on a farm and I couldn't wait to get off the farm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, little John Deere B tractors and old alfalfa fields and two days to plow seven acres wasn't my lifestyle. <laughs> but look where I ended up. 
I love <laughs> agriculture. So there is a lot of careers out there in agriculture. Change the subject here a little bit. Lori, this came in last week. This is the one time we asked this question, one answer, all spring. Box elder bugs, lots of them. What do you do about them? Well, the best thing you could do is really just kind of vacuum them up with a shop vac. Yep. And yeah, it's it, make sure you don't smash them on anything white because yeah, they're gonna definitely stain. But they, they come and go. So yeah, shop vac's your, your buddy her, to get rid of them. Okay, and that question came in from Kalispell, so now we know. And from Shields Valley, uh, this caller has a weed with a bulb. It is shallow rooted weed and is bluegrass long. Will a weed and feed product kill that weed? I have no idea what that is. Do you? Um, a small bulb. No, I, other than maybe it's a hyacinth or something like that. They might have a bulb in there. Will weed and feed kill it? I do not think that the weed and feed will, will actually take care of the problem. The weed and feed um, hits weeds as they germinate, as they come out. So that may not work very well. And if it's a bulb, it may be a lily which means it's a monocot species. Yeah, yeah. So it won't be killed by a broadleaf herbicide. If you only have a few of them, dig, dig them, them out. out. Okay, <laughs> that works. Uh, Yuda from Great Falls, this came, call came in last week. I jotted it down. Uh, this person wanted to know about using fungicides and barley. They grow continuous barley and they have seen a lot of disease. Where could they get information on the fungicides, and they also want to know, does MSU test fungicides for cereal disease control? Okay, um, so what fungicide is best to use would depend on what's the predominant disease problem. So if they know that already, then that's a good starting point. If they still need to find out what is exactly the disease issue, I would recommend contacting your local extension agent and um, bringing them a sample probably in a couple of weeks from now, because things are probably not too green at this point. And, or the diagnostic lab at Bozeman, uh, at MSU in Bozeman can help too. That would be me looking at that. And then once we know what the disease problem is, um, I could direct them to um, fungicide uh, guides that we have available on the plant pathology uh, MSU extension website. Um, the other part of the question was if MSU is testing for fungicide efficiency. Do efficacy. you have variety testing in fungicides on uh, cereal grains for uh, yield potential and stuff? Um, so I know in terms of the breeding program, the breeders typically score their breeding lines for what diseases occur and how resistant or tolerant they are. And typically when a variety is released, that information is included. Um, I do not test fungicides as of now um, for disease control on barley diseases. There may be other, you know, uh, researchers at the research centers or, you know, in other labs that do. I would have to, you know, ask some people and find that out. But typically the information that we get, we would put them in those month guides um, that are available in the extension store. So, you know, foliar disease control of small grain crops, there would be information on which fungicides would be suitable. All right, thank you. Uh, couple of questions with Precision Ag. And this first one came from Bozeman last week and I said we'd answer it this week. What is the definition of Precision mm -hmm. Ag? per se, and that is a good question. What does it mean? You know, like many other things, you would see very different definitions if you ask different people, but it, it is about uh, making decisions based on data you collect from your field, and uh, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, that typically agronomists, they, will, they would drive by and look at the field and make a decision, you know, what is going on. So we, we do, for, a, for a large field, you don't see whoever is going by the edge of the field, don't see what is happening, you know, deep into the, into the field. So it's about collecting data at a, at a finer resolution all, around, all across the field and then making decision, decisions based on that. One of the definitions I use is it is you, it's uh, um, using technology to, to provide the right input at the right time in the right amount and at the right place. 
So it's, it has a, a, a time aspect to it. You know, you, you have to provide that input at, at, at the right time. It has a space aspect to it. So a, a very distinct thing in precision ag is that our, our conventional agriculture, you know, we do, for example, our researchers do variety trials and, and field trials across the state and make recommendation. So, uh, you know, wheat requires this much nitrogen around this, this uh, growth stage. Um, but there is variability in the soil. Soil is not same across you take a 40 acre or a 100 acre field, your soil is not same everywhere. So depending on how much moisture is available, how much organic matter is there, it's um, you know elevation differences and things like that, you, you may not require the same, same amount of um, fertilizer everywhere. Or in other words, I call it yield potential. You know, the field has different yield potential in different places, depending on the soil and the soil characteristics. So, you know, changing your input to spatially, that is one very definite aspect of precision agriculture. But it is also about using sensors to collect data across the field. Every time a machine is going on your field, it's collecting data. It could be yield. It could be how much chemical you're applying or how much um, seed you're planting rate or the color of your soil. So it's about using sensors to collect data, then analyzing that data to make a decision on how much input to, to apply. There is also an aspect about robotics. You know, we, you know, recent times there is so much, so many people are working on you know, uh, robotic tractors, robotic sprays, you know, drones, you know, the common term is drone, I call it unmanned aerial systems, that is, um, that is also an example of uh, robotics. So, you know, you bringing in new technologies, um, using artificial intelligence, and making decisions based on actually what the data is uh, are telling you. Let me follow it up a little bit. I read an article probably last year in Crop Life magazine that said that using <coughs> precision ag techniques, a lot of producers can save 10 to 15% on herbicide mm -hmm. costs. At the price of glyphosate right now, if you save 10 to 15%, number one, you're not using as much in the environment, but number two, you're saving money. Absolutely. And does that work pretty well here in the state of Montana? Because we use a lot of Roundup. Y yeah, and I think that technology is coming on to the market. John Deere introduced an, a new um, sprayer this year that, that you, the nozzles turn on and off automatically. You're spraying only where you're hitting weed, where the weeds are detected. Amazing. And so you're saving glyphosate. Far more, you know, there's some other, um, there's some weed it technology is another one that's out there. There's a weed chipper that's out there that has cameras on it that chips out the uh, large weeds in, in kosha or slight kosha and fallow, for example. Leaves a big hole. It's not the most ideal thing you've ever worked with, but there is a lot of that that's coming online. And it does have the potential to really reduce the amount of herbicide that we use. So it's environmental benefit as well as a financial benefit. Absolutely. Okay, uh, back to Lori. Uh, this is a good one. Green caterpillars in a gooseberry bush. What are they? What do you do for them? Oh, yeah, I think gooseberries have a, a sawfly. Uh, and you should probably contact me. Maybe we could follow up on, on and maybe you can send me a sample this spring. So I'll have to look up the life cycle for that because I, I think there's a, there, I don't know if it's called the gooseberry sawfly, but there, are, there is a sawfly issue. And the sawfly looks like a caterpillar, but, but as an adult, it looks, it's, really, it's closely related to a wasp. Okay, so it wouldn't be very good in your gooseberry pie to just let them. <laughs> oh, I don't think so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, let's move on. This is from Billings. Interesting question. Fertilizer costs are skyrocketing. Is MSU teaching and or researching regenerative ag principles such as no-till to assist ag users get away from costly fertilizer? I don't think we can get away completely, but we can probably make it more efficient using 
precision technology. I, right? I would say so. You know, um, we, before we started, we were chatting here about the the cost, how much the cost of fertilizers and pesticides, you know, glyphosate, um, they are going up. So, you know, we, I think uh, uh, maybe last month or so, you know, we got some uh, question about what material is available there to, to help our producers make some decisions um, in, you know, if they are using fertilizer, they want to make sure it is effective, efficient, and, uh, you know, that nitrogen use efficiency and things like that. Um, so precision ag is certainly a technology to, to cut down on fertilizer usage, but there, is, there are other, perhaps other technology, you know, I'm not a, uh, expert in this area. Um, I, I, what I did is I contacted our land resources and environmental sciences department, that is uh, Tim's department here, and uh, asked uh, uh, Klein Jones to, to, you know, proactively provide some of these educational materials to um, grain growers or, or other um, you know, other groups and uh, to the media to help with that. But certainly precision ag is one way to, to reduce the, the amount of input we apply, any, any kind of input, including fertilizer. Sounds good, thank you. And I, I'm old school, I'm not familiar with precision ag, but what I'm hearing is pretty impressive. And if you're not into it today, you're going to be if you want to stay yeah. on the farm. So that's my attitude. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Tim from Shields Valley, the caller said the weed that we thought might be a lily is probably bulbous bluegrass, and that's very possible. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Yuda, this person from Billings has planted their peas, and it's a little warmer in Billings, mm -hmm. but I think we're supposed uh -oh, to get yeah. 8 to 12 <laughs> inches of snow in yeah. Billings this week. They want to know if the soil stays cold and the peas don't germinate, will they rot in the ground and how long before they rot? Hmm. It's a guess, but have at it. Right, so I think one one question would be that they use a seed treatment. Seed treatments are really good at preventing seed rot, so if the seed lies dormant in the ground, a fungicide seed treatment can protect the seed from those uh, pathogens, fun fungal pathogens that are present in the ground that can attack the seed. And they typically last, uh, we say, two to three weeks. So that might help. I would be concerned if this, the peas started to germinate already that the seedlings may suffer from the cold. So um, let's see what happens next week. Don't plant tomatoes yet. <laughs> no, it's not the time for tomatoes, is it? <laughs> Hold your horses on tomatoes. <laughs> exactly. OK. Uh, for Shrika, this person has heard of soil acidification. Mm. And I think that's in a lot of areas of the state, but especially in the highwood bench area and so mm -hmm. forth. Can precision ag techniques help to reduce acidification? Um, again, our soil scientists have been working on, you know, their estimate is that around 500,000 acres in uh, uh, Montana is uh, has uh, soil acidification problem. Um, you know, our, uh, pr how precision, you know, you, you have to apply something like a lime or something to combat it, but how precision agriculture can help is that with the input cost, we cannot apply, our producers cannot make a profit if they are going to apply lime across the lime or spend lime or whatever it is, uh, treat the entire field. So that's where precision agriculture come into picture. You, if you have a 100 acre field, maybe you have a 20 acres that has acidity pro problem, not the entire field. But right. if you apply lime or spend lime or the, uh, these, you know, from our uh, sugar beet processing plant, you know, the spend lime coming, that's, uh, that's cheaper. If you apply to the entire field, it is still very expensive. But with the precision ag, if you can map where the acidity is and you can do this variable rate application depending on the, the pH level in those areas that has acidity, then it is, it is more doable. So that's where precision ag come into picture. Okay, uh, question came in via Facebook uh, from Wolf Creek. And this is a good question. Uh, they had a major grasshopper issue last year and they were looking online for some grasshopper bait. 
and I guess they're out of stock. Any suggestion where they might get bait this year? And is that something that we're short of nationwide again? Yeah, actually, I had a few questions about that in the last couple of weeks. And what what they're talking about is there there's a fungus called Nosema that's that's used to uh, against used to control grasshoppers and. Last year we were pretty much out of stock, and what you do actually is you apply it around your your property, and uh, the uh, the grasshoppers will contact the fungus, and and um, uh, it's pretty much grasshopper specific, so it ends up killing the the grasshoppers, and it's it's not 100% effective. It's usually will cut down about 50% of the population, but they were out of stock last year, probably about I don't know I don't know if they were out of stock all year, but. This year, they are. Uh, they say they're out of stock, and then I called the distributor, and they said that they, they're releasing product to their online distributors in May and June, and then when they're out, they're out. So I think it's going to be really difficult for people to get the, the only one that's available right now. The only brand is Nolo Bait. So you could try to call your online supplier and get on the list, on a waiting list, but they're they're not going to be making any more, and I don't I don't know I don't know why. Interesting. Everything seems to be short in agriculture and more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this cold snap we're supposed to be getting this week. I saw the low of maybe 7 degrees here in Gallatin County this week. Uh, 10 to 12 inches of snow in some areas below zero, not below zero, below freezing temperatures for a prolonged period. Is that going to reduce the grasshopper numbers? It's going to depend on on, uh, on egg hatch. So okay. if if it's if it coincides, we have some overlapping generations of grasshoppers. Uh, usually they they overwinter in the egg stage. So if if it happens to hit the egg stage in that particular area, then then yeah, it'll have an impact on them. And if it stays wet, that's good too. Okay. Uh, ironically, uh, we were talking ahead of time before the program this evening about some. Erosion, and this question did come in tonight from Carbon County, and they say after a wildland fire, what should property owners do to rejuvenate the property, and what steps should they take to avoid noxious weed, invasive species, and erosion? Ooh, that's Here's. a really good question and a really complicated question. So it might it depends on what the land use is. You know, we did some research at Red Bluff. Um, sheep ranch out in Bozeman after the fire in 2012 and we monitored what the, how much grass came back in the burned area, how much um, grass came back in the bulldozer line that was used to combat the fire and we compared it to the unburned. So if you're talking native rangeland in Montana and the fire was not too hot, I think you'll see the grass come back and there's probably not a lot you need to do unless you had a whole lot of cheat grass there before maybe and you might have to manage it post fire. So I think you have to figure out what you have there. In cropland systems, if stubble burns, things like that, I would say one of the best things to do is to get a crop in the ground and get vegetation covering it, whether it's a cover crop or a wheat crop so that we prevent that erosion from going. Um, if you think about managing noxious weeds, what we want to make sure we prevent is bringing seeds in. So if you're going to go in and reseed, do some things like that, go with clean equipment, wash it off, make sure you didn't bring a lot of weed seed from around the yard into the fire and I think into the fire area. And I think monitoring and figuring out what sort of plan you might need and what areas might be prioritized. That's actually something we talk about in maybe precision ag in the rangeland system, having your vegetation mapped so you know, okay, this is full of cheatgrass, this is full of weeds, that's where I might concentrate my revegetation and my, and my um, restoration work. Okay, good answer, thank you. Uh, Lori, this person has a small red bug, tiny they say, on their houseplants. Any idea what it might be? Oh, a red bug on their houseplants. Huh. When I think of this really small red bug, I think of a clover mite. And I don't yep. know, this would be the time of year that they might be coming in, but they usually they usually don't come too far into the house, but if you, please send me a picture or something to maybe even a sample and we could try to figure out what that is. All right, two questions on precision ag. Uh, is it applicable to livestock production? And this call came from Hobson. 
It is applicable to livestock, uh, although if you look nationally, there is a lot more work done on crop than livestock. So I see it as a, an opportunity for us. Montana State University, we have our crop and livestock are equally important for us. Um, so there, there is work done on, you know, a, a company, a presentation I listened to, they have this drone-based uh, herding of cow. They said they could cut down on the number of cowboys by using drone, but, but that's mm -hmm. one aspect of it. But, you know, monitoring your cows individually to see, you know, how they are doing, they are moving around, they are eating and what their metabolic is, body temperature is, that kind of stuff. But also, um, you know, this technology is already there, monitoring how much each cow is eating. You know, there, we in our have our, um, our uh, um, livestock farm there. We have a, a grow safe. You know, you can monitor for each cow how, how when they come and how much they eat and uh, and. So you, it's uh, you know in in uh, in crop we say precision ag is farming by the square inch or you know managing each plant individually. In livestock it is more like managing it each cow individually rather than as a herd. That's one aspect. The other aspect is managing the rangeland. You know from overgrazing and uh, you know weed for example you know invasive or otherwise weed management and things like that. Okay, thank you, Anne. From Bozeman, this person would like to know how expensive it is to become involved in adopting precision ag procedures. Sure. And maybe Diamond could answer that in two weeks, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had this uh, silver bullet answer there. You know, that's why research and outreach is very important. You know, one of my um, advisory committee members asked, you know, there are four companies who have approached me with uh, their separate systems that would do the same thing. How do I know which one to go for? And how do I actually know whether I will lose money or make money on this? That's why we need research and, uh, and uh, you know, to, to develop technology specifically for Montana and also validate, evaluate technologies in Montana conditions. You know, some of these technologies are out there, you know, applying fertilizer or seed or water in a variable rate manner. It's out there, but we still have to, to to, to customize it to, to a farmer or a, or a field. You know, some technologies look at the previous yield to decide how much fertilizer need to be applied and where it need to be applied. Others use soil test, you know, in this distributed soil test to quantify fertility levels and then apply. So there are, there are a variety of ways you can use technology, but the important thing is that you cannot take that technology from elsewhere and blindly apply here to your field. And so, you know, when you do research, you do demonstration, you do validation, you are going to look at a certain set of conditions in a field, or in one or multiple fields here, and then reporting whether it is going to be, you know, the cost you pay, the what you pay for that technology, is going to make sense for farmers or, or ranchers here in Montana, whether it's, it is going to, you know, how, how long it will take. It's going to pay off in two years, five years or it's 10 years, whatever, you know, what they can do. So that's where, why I would say that it is very important that we do that kind of research here. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a once in the spring question <laughs> for you. <Yuta. laughs> this person had a lot of blossom end rot last year mm. on their tomatoes. I uh, would like to use the same uh, planting beds this year, but wondering if that's a good idea. And how do you get rid of blossom end rot and why? Right. It seems very early to answer this question. Maybe we'll come back to it later this year. But for now, <laughs> blossom end rot is um, caused by a deficiency in its calcium, right, Jack? Yeah. And so um, I don't see a problem with using the same soil, but you would want to make sure that sufficient amounts of calcium are present in the soil. So amending the soil um, with some fertilizer or some other ingredient that supplies that calcium would be a good way to help with that problem yeah okay and i promise that i probably won't bring it back again all right then <laughs> well write your answer down because this is it <laughs> all right uh laurie brought a pet along you know 
Entomologists are a little strange. Uh, most people have dogs and cats. Says the plant pathologist. <laughs> okay. But this is kind of an interesting creature here, and um, I don't know what you've named this one. Is that George or Betty or? This one does not have a name, but this is a vinegaroon. And I'm not sure what camera I'm looking at here, but the vinegaroon, this is, uh, oh good. Yeah, I'll hold it down a little bit. Uh, this is actually from uh, Arizona. We don't have vinegaroons. It's a type of arachnid. We don't have them in Montana. So it's a type of arachnid, and uh, it's, they, this, uh, we have them in Arizona. We also have them in Central and South America, in, in the East Indies and Asia. And they get their name from having this long whip. They're called whip scorpions or vinegaroons. They shoot out acetic acid from this tail, and they use that acetic acid in addition to a solvent to uh, break down the, the skin uh, the exoskeleton of an insect. So that's, they're actually a really good pet. They are harmless to humans. <laughs> uh, they're nocturnal and they build lots of, they build burrows in sand or underneath logs and they come out at night to, to grab prey and, and they're uh, pretty much blind. So they use these first pair of legs of their four legs to kind of as feelers. So, and they eat crickets. So earlier, when, before we, when I brought this out earlier, a bunch of people were asking if this was fish bait, and it's not <laughs> fish bait, so since we don't have it in Montana. They you don't know. eat grasshoppers? They, uh, they, they would actually eat grasshoppers probably if I pulled off the spiny legs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing I should try this summer. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was our cute pet for the evening. Cute uh, pet for sure. Yeah. On that note, Tim, I'm going to throw this one at you because it's one of those great questions that probably doesn't have a real good answer. But a person from Bozeman has a problem with three rabbits eating leaves of crocus and spinach. What can they do humanely to <laughs> take care of that problem? I do not know. I would probably eat the rabbit. <laughs> um, they are tasty. Yeah, I, yeah I, I really like rabbit. Um, I don't have a good answer for that one. I don't know how to keep rabbits out of... Get a dog. Yeah, get they, a dog. They'll run them out. Yep. Uh, we had rabbits, and then we got two golden retrievers. We have no more rabbits. Mm -hmm. um, rabbits do not like Wouldn't them. a humane thing uh, to do be to just plant more of what they like to eat? <laughs> like, is, that the, is that the answer? You know, Maybe covering it with chicken wire, too. Yeah, you could you do know. that, yeah, yeah. But they'll find something else in the yard yeah. to eat. Uh, interesting question from Joplin, and you, know, you may not remember this, but this person wants to know whatever happened to the dreaded disease of wheat called carnal butt? Hmm. I heard stories. Um, I think we just got it under control. Okay, now maybe you maybe you should better tell that story because <laughs> it is kind of an interesting story, and I'm pretty sure I know who. You were this probably question. involved, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, this is back in the 90s, I think 96. Uh, they found mm -hmm. a quarantinable disease in Arizona on Desert Durham. And APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, said, we're going to eradicate it. And so a bunch of us went down and attended that meeting. And I came back, along with some others, and just said, you know, we plant some Durham in Montana that originates in Arizona from different fields, of course. I said, I am a little bit uncomfortable. Don Matthew was uncomfortable, several of us from the department. So we requested some samples from Joplin, and they had carnal bunt, which is not a very serious disease. It's mm -hmm. a quarantinable disease. If that had gone in the soil 10 days later, when mm -hmm. it was scheduled to be planted, the entire grain crop in Montana would have been quarantined, and we could not export it. And last week, as Cassie said, we export 80% of our grain, so we had had 80% of the wheat sitting in bins here. Mm -hmm. It's a minor disease, it was political disease. Mm -hmm. It's no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. So enough said with that. Uh, this is an interesting one here. How do you resuscitate a tired old lawn planted on old soil without starting over completely? And I'll open that up to whoever wants to. My lawn looks terrible, so I'm not going to ask. I would probably dethatch it first if yeah. it was really right. dense. Aeration, and then yeah. probably now I would seed it, perhaps, if, or, you know, aerate it, get the soil a little bit lighter if it's been compaction. At my house, I have kids who really compact the lawn, and today I was out there trying to aerate it as best I could. 
Um, and then I would re I would probably reseed it. Um, I put some grass seed down today, and I'm going to let the snow and the rain and whatever we have really soak it in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. I agree with you entirely. And just to add, we, we also have a monk guide. Cheryl Moore Goff put a monk guide together on, on growing lawns in Montana. So you could either get that on the MSU Extension Store, or you can contact me, and I could, I could definitely get you the, the monk guide for that. 994-5704. Yep, that's right. <laughs> How's that? OK. Um, question here uh, from Billings. This person has heard of uh, Precision Ag Boot Camp. I haven't heard of that. Can you tell us what that might be? Yeah, um, you know, you, you can contact me to get more information. It's a, um, a, a, a number of faculty in our college is working together, you know, Alan Dyer, Shannon Arnold, and our four new uh, Precision Act faculty members. Perhaps I think Bruce, uh, Mac, you know, Bruce is also involved, mm -hmm. Bruce Maxwell. So, um, Two things we are trying to do. We, we received a grant from CHS Foundation to, to educate our students. You know, part of it is to, to convert one of our farms to a precision ag and sustainability learning farm. So that's going to be our Lutz farm. But our precision ag group just, you know, they have been here for two months and, uh, and we don't have a connectivity there. So we are working on it. But in the meantime, this summer, we are putting together this boot camp under the leadership of Alan Dyer, but several people are involved to, to train our students. It's open to community members as well, um, to you know the different aspect of precision ag, what, what you can do. So if I remember correctly, it is uh, structured as you know morning, uh, mornings they will provide uh, lectures and uh, you know share information. Then afternoon they go to the farm and, uh, and uh, try their hand on some of these technologies. That's what I think it is in, I can't remember ex exact dates, but it is sometime in June. But you know, contact me, I can, I can share that information. Yeah, you know, something I probably ought to get involved with uh, just to kind of increase a little bit. I mean, I'm so far behind in precision A yeah. that technology has advanced rapidly and uh, I haven't kept up with it. So, so the, the um, general consensus is that the precision agriculture technologies last two to three years. They keep changing the new and the cooler, newer and cooler. it's like a cell phone, you know. <laughs> as soon as you buy something, there is something new and cooler outside, out there. So, you know, two to three years is what they say. So if you are, you know, I have been here, I haven't been doing research for three years, and uh, I feel like I am totally out of touch. I can believe that. Yeah. You know, Jack, I have to say there are some producers in the state who are using a lot of these things on their phones. And sometimes when we discuss crop-related health questions, maybe herbicide injury carryover, and they can whip out their phones and tell me exactly what they sprayed on what date and what the weather was, yeah. that is a really great technology to keep your records on your farm and mm -hmm. have it in a place where it's accessible. Yeah. Good point. I, that, we didn't have that a few years back. Yeah. So I like that. Well, I have you up, this person uh, from Ledger, and do you know where Ledger is, everybody? Hmm. It's way up north. Uh, this person <laughs> wants to know if they can use a tine weeder to control field bindweed. And I don't know what a tine weeder is for sure. Yeah, so a tine weeder is tech, is a, is a implement, it's a mechanical implement that's pulled by a tractor. And really it's kind of a spring-loaded um, tine that comes down with a little hook on the end. and you can set it more aggressively or less aggressively and it goes down and it rips up the surface of the soil about an inch or so and it really gets out the annual weeds that you might have. I would assume that this would be someone who'd be using it in an organic situation and so there's a couple times you can use it and normally you can plant put your seed down below the surface, come over the top with a tine weeder and get those little bitty annual weeds that are germinating. You then can come back when the cereals emerge and you can go back over the top of it again and get the second flush of annual weeds that came out. 
Will it work for bindweed? The answer is no, because bindweed is a perennial plant that has a deep rhizome in the ground. So if you rip it off the top, it's just going to regrow. It's really, tine weeding is really good for spring annual weeds that are just germinating around your crop. And usually the crop is bigger and the little annual weeds are smaller, so you can rip those tines over it without damaging your stand too much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Giroux says boot camp is June 6th to June 10th, <laughs> and uh, we can get a hold of, I'll tell you what, we'll put that date in the Ag, uh, Ag Live newsletter, which you can get by signing up for it online. And a Billings caller uh, called in and says he keeps rabbits out of his peas by spreading a boundary of mothballs every four to five inches apart. <laughs> That's a lot of mothballs. That would be expensive in my estimation. And a question from Great Falls. Uh, Cassie last week talked about the high quality of Montana grain. And this caller would like to know, will precision ag techniques continue to enhance Montana's grain quality? Good question. Potentially. You know, again, one of the things before I, I moved to this position, one of the things we were looking at was uh, variable rate manage, management of inputs to, to um, improve the quality of the grain, nutritional quality of the grain. Now, I am, I am not, again, an expert in this, but certain micronutrients, you know, you can spray selectively or, you know, there is, there is the potential there. But I would say, generally speaking, if you are providing the nutrients and you are managing your crop in an as-needed basis, you know, where it is needed, you are providing nutrients. Where it is needed, you are managing the insects. Or you are managing the insects when it starts, before it spreads to the whole field. You know, you are going to, to end up with a, with a good quality crop. So I would say yes. Okay. Yuda, this person from Bozeman put in a stone patio mm. uh, a couple years ago, and the trees surrounding that patio don't look very good. Is that because of the patio going in, do you think? It could be. It would depend on what trees they are and how close to the patio they are. But if you think about the stone patio that adds the weight to the ground and to the roots that are probably underneath and so that weight might slowly have killed or is killing the roots and that might be what the trees are suffering from. We'd have to have a look at the site and you know get a little more information but I think there could be a relationship yes. If they did any deep uh, digging to put that patio in, they could have Certainly if they the injured yeah. the roots, for sure, Very yes. possible. Uh, caller says, regenerative ag uses nitrogen-producing companion crops, such as legumes, to pull nitrogen out of the air and make it available for the primary crops, such as corn. Is, MA, is MSU teaching regenerative ag at all? That's a good question. I don't know, Tim, do you know? You know, my, my understanding is that our, our classes provide, you know, cover broad perspectives in agriculture or, or uh, cover all kinds of agriculture to some degree, but maybe the most emphasis is on conventional agriculture. You know, Tim? You yeah, I, I think we do cover some topics in regenerative agriculture. You know, um, Northern Ag Research Center in Haver, there was a project that Darren Boss started looking at taking out fallow from our wheat fallow rotation and putting cover crops in there where we assessed soil health. We looked at the trade-offs of soil water usage. Um, we looked at the response of insects um, in those senses. Um, I think a lot of people out there are using um, different regenerative ag techniques, whether that's in ranching or that's in row crops. Um, you know, a lot of people look to use legumes as green manure crops to add nitrogen to their fields, especially um, organic producers. That's really their main source of nitrogen in the state. But we do look more and more at ways of reducing fallow in Montana, which is 
necessary but also a difficult part of our cropping system and that's where regenerative ag practices mixing in some cover crops in there occasionally and and working on soil health is out there so we do that in in a number of disciplines i think i think that's absolutely correct you know i want to add to that you know our land resources and environmental sciences uh, the teaching programs there has a strong focus on sustainability so when you talk about the sustainable agriculture you know regenerative agriculture organic agriculture they are part of it but i would also suggest that the next time you bring bruce maxwell ask him this question he would know more. <laughs> <laughs> he sat here last week and we right. picked his brain a little bit. Okay, uh, interesting. With the advent of all the electric vehicles over the past few years, is there anything being done in electric tractors? Mm. Um, I am, um, you know, if we are talking about our conventional size tractors, there has been re uh, research looking at the diesel electric, you know, like a diesel generator that generate electricity and then the tractor is running on electricity. So that is for our conventional size uh, tractors. But I don't know, maybe there are small scale robotic machines like, a, like a unmanned aerial systems that may be running on battery but i'm i other than that you know i'm not aware of any i i haven't heard of any but i have heard of this next question which is a follow-up what about autonomous tractors driverless tractors yeah are those on the horizon so um case um ih that's one of the tractor companies they had a fully autonomous tractor for at least five or six years they just one model, they take it to shows, but uh, I don't think that they have been selling it to producers. So it is out there and, uh, and it is possible. They are showing that um, you can do it. And then um, John Deere, I saw a recent uh, news from John Deere saying that by the end of this year, they will have a fully autonomous tractor in the market. So it is out there. That's amazing. Yeah. It really is. I've seen a fully autonomous cedar. It's basically the cedar with two wheels on the side and the wheels are driving it on the side and there's no tractor actually attached to it and it's an autonomous um, cedar. Uh, for which crops out of curiosity? Um, mostly for higher value crops. Um, they may be corn. You know, they'll land in other crops that are not necessarily grown in Montana first, but it's out there on the horizon. Technology, amazing. Why well, have you up, Tim? This person from Hoagland, and it could also be any other place in the state, wants to know how to control dandelions in alfalfa. And boy, this valley could really use some yeah. control. Yeah, that's a really, actually a pretty tough question. Managing, you know, we, dandelions can become perennial plants and they have really large rootstocks and they can actually take a fair amount of yield from you and, and your alfalfa crops and dry down at a different rate in your hay a little bit. So what can you do to manage it? A lot of the best management te techniques, maybe if it's Roundup Ready alfalfa, would be apply Roundup in the fall when the, when the alfalfa is down and low in stature and the dandelion is sort of greened up for its fall period. You can use a herbicide called Velpar in the springtime. Um, that works pretty well. And then there's another herbicide, Raptor, that people commonly use for weed control, and that's an Amazomox herbicide um, in alfalfa. But they, varying degrees of success, it's actually a pretty, tough, a pretty tough problem. And I think, you know, you might, if it's an older stand of alfalfa, you could think of refurbishing that stand and, and putting some new plants in there. And Actually, I'd rather see them tear it out. Yep and grow grain for a couple of years, get rid of some of the weeds, mm -hmm. and then go back to alfalfa. Yep. Uh, if you follow alfalfa with alfalfa, you can run into some serious disease problems, yep. and you can touch on that. Yeah, especially I think there is this, um, if you seed alfalfa uh, after an alfalfa crop, when alfalfa decomposes in the soil, it produces some compound that is actually toxic on alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And so you may have issues even establishing uh, a new alfalfa crop if you follow it directly on an old one. Yeah, correct. Uh, this is a Facebook question that came in this week. Gene from Big Fork. 
<laughs> this is interesting. They have hundreds of brown worms on their porch. Some of them are coming inside, but a lot of them die outside before they come in. Not enough robins there yet. This happens in the fall too. What are they? How do you get rid of them? Well, they probably aren't worms. They're probably they're garden millipedes. If they're about an inch long, brown, kind of curl up. Uh, they actually will, uh, once they get into the house, they're, they're not going to reproduce. But sometimes they could be a big nuisance outside. So you could either, you can apply some sort of, they call, it, call them foundation sprays in the fall and the spring, and that can cut down on them coming into the house. But you can also just do some standard stuff to try to keep them from coming in, like some caulking around the foundation and door sweeps and, and make sure that your screens are intact. They're going to try to come in the basement. Okay. But if it gets really bad and it's, and it's like that, you could definitely spray a fat foundation spray. And you can contact me at 994 uh, and I could help you out with that. All right. Uh, we're down to a very short period of time yet, but this question came in from Manhattan, and it has to do with potatoes and precision ag. Are there a lot of precision ag techniques being used in potato production now? It's a good question. I, I don't know answer to that, Jack. I'm not sure either, but you would expect with the amount of fertilizer yeah. that potato producers utilize and herbicides and insecticides, I suspect there's probably room for some yeah, chemical application, you know, you can use that on any crop, but I, potato specific, I can't say much. Okay. Yeah. Is there Tim, some precision irrigation technologies coming there is, in? Yes, there is. Definitely. Tim, in 10 seconds, when do you start controlling dandelions in lawns? Oh, today was a pretty good day. Well, wait till after this snowfall. <laughs> I would yep. say so. <laughs> and when it gets warm. Yep, yeah, a little and bit warm. Another week or so, yep. based on what we have this week. I'd like to thank the panel. We're down to the last few minutes. We will not be here next week. Uh, Easter Sunday, we're taking that Sunday off. The following week, we'll have Diema Hyken here from Triangle Ag Services to talk about how precision ag techniques are being used here in the state. Shrika, thanks for the time. Everybody, thank you for watching. See you in two weeks. Have a good week. Good night. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you, the friends of Montana PBS. Thank you. And by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com.